The Crusades, a series of medieval expeditions that shaped the course of history, religion, and politics in Europe and the Middle East. From the fervor of the First Crusade to the unexpected twists of the Fourth, we will uncover the underlying reasons, key figures, significant events, and lasting historical significance of this remarkable period in human history. Join us as we delve into the historical endeavor to reach the Holy Land and the significant influence it had on global events. The Crusades were a series of religious wars that unfolded between the 11th and 13th century, pitting Christians against Muslims. These conflicts were primarily initiated with the aim of securing control over holy sites revered by both religious groups. In total, eight major crusade expeditions took place between the years 1096 and 1291. These campaigns varied in size, strength, and levels of success. They encompassed a wide array of military and political endeavors, all with the common goal of gaining dominance in the holy lands of the Middle East. The Crusades were characterized by their high cost, extreme violence, and at times ruthless tactics. As a consequence, they played a pivotal role in elevating the influence and prestige of European Christians on the global stage, firmly establishing them as significant participants in the struggle for territorial control in the Middle East. The motivations behind the Crusades have long been a subject of debate. Within this historical narrative, a stark dichotomy emerges. There are those who assert that the Crusades were primarily motivated by greed and a thirst for territorial expansion. In this view, the expeditions were opportunistic endeavors that exploited religious fervor to advance political and economic interests. Conversely, there is another perspective that holds that the Crusaders were sincere in their intentions to liberate the Holy Lands from non-Christian control. According to this interpretation, the Crusades were acts of devotion, driven by a profound desire to protect and reclaim the holy sites of Christianity. For many crusaders, these campaigns represented a form of armed pilgrimage, a means to express their unwavering faith, or an opportunity to secure their place in history through righteous deeds. However, the truth lies somewhere in between. Throughout the complex history of the Crusades, we encounter notable figures who undoubtedly pursued personal gain and power, exploiting the fervor of the times. In the later sections of this video, we will delve into the stories of such individuals who leveraged the Crusades for their own ambitions. Yet it's important to recognize that the majority of those who embarked on these perilous journeys likely saw them as a blend of faith and opportunity. For the average Crusader, the motivations were multifaceted. They may have been driven by their deep devotion to Christianity, viewing the Crusades as a righteous mission to safeguard their religious heritage. At the same time, they might have seen this as an opportunity to elevate their own status and make a name for themselves in a world where such exploits were highly esteemed. In essence, the Crusades were a complex tapestry of motives. While some individuals undoubtedly saw personal gain and influence, the broader Crusader ranks consisted of people whose motivations were a fusion of genuine religious convictions and aspirations for personal glory. In the 11th century, the city of Jerusalem had been under Muslim control for centuries after Caliph Umar's conquest in the mid-700s. However, during this time, a new power emerged in the Middle East, the Seljuks, a force that posed a growing threat to the Christian Eastern Roman Empire in Anatolia. In 1095, Eastern Roman Emperor Alexios I turned to Pope Urban II for aid against the encroaching Seljuk menace. It was during the Council of Clermont that same year that Pope Urban II officially called for what would become the First Crusade. Four armies of crusaders were assembled, each drawing troops from different Western European regions. These forces were led by notable leaders, Raymond of St. Gilles, Godfrey of Bouillon, Hugh of Vermandois, in Bohemond of Taranto. Raymond's army hailed from Provence, Godfrey led forces from Lorraine and northern France, Hugh gathered soldiers from France, and Bohemond's army consisted of Normans from southern Italy. In August 1096, these armies embarked on their journey to Byzantium. Alongside these organized forces, a less structured group known as the People's Crusade set forth earlier, led by a charismatic preacher named Peter the Hermit. Disregarding Emperor Alexios' counsel to await the arrival of the other crusaders, Peter's contingent crossed the Bosphorus Strait in early August. Their rashness led to a dire outcome, as Turkish forces decisively defeated them at the Battle of Sivetot. Upon the arrival of the four primary crusader armies in Constantinople, Emperor Alexios made a critical demand that the leaders pledge their loyalty to him and acknowledge his authority over the territories reclaimed from the Turks, as well as any other lands they might conquer. All leaders complied except for Bohemond, who resisted taking the oath. 
in May 1097, the Crusaders, in alliance with Imperial forces, launched an assault on Nicaea, the Seljuk capital in Anatolia. By late June, the city surrendered to their combined might. Despite mounting tensions between the Crusaders and the Emperor, the United Forces continued their march through Anatolia. In June 1098, they captured the strategic city of Antioch in Syria, a pivotal moment in the campaign. Following internal conflicts over control of Antioch, the Crusaders embarked on their final journey towards Jerusalem, which was then held by the Egyptian Fatimids, who, as Shiite Muslims, were adversaries of the Sunni Seljuks. Arriving before the walls of Jerusalem in 1099, the Christian forces compelled the city's besieged governor to surrender in mid-July, marking the triumphant conclusion of the First Crusade. However, despite the commander's best efforts to maintain order, the crusade ended with an episode of violence. Many crusaders engaged in a devastating massacre against the city's Jewish and Muslim inhabitants, staining the end of the First Crusade with bloodshed. Furthermore, despite the initial pledge made to Emperor Alexios I that the conquered lands would be returned to the empire, this promise was not upheld. Instead, New Crusader states were established in the conquered territories. These states were governed by Western European nobility who had participated in the crusade, signaling a significant shift in power dynamics in the region. Following the swift and unexpectedly easy victory of the First Crusade, the newly established Crusader states in the Holy Land managed to fend off Muslim forces independently for roughly three decades without requiring external European assistance. However, in response to the First Crusade, the Muslims declared a jihad, their own version of a holy war, aiming to regain control of the region. Slowly but steadily, they began securing tactical victories against the Crusaders in the subsequent years. A pivotal moment came in 1144, when the Seljuk general Zangi successfully besieged and captured the city of Edessa, a major stronghold in the region. This dealt a severe blow to the Crusaders, prompting Pope Eugene III to take action. The result was the calling of the Second Crusade. This time, two major European monarchs pledged their commitment to the cause and sent their troops to the Holy Land. These leaders were Louis VII of France and Conrad III of Germany. Yet, the Second Crusade faced a multitude of challenges from the outset. Coordination between the European forces and their allies in the Middle East proved challenging, making it difficult for the different forces to effectively synchronize their efforts. In October 1147, the Turks delivered a devastating blow by defeating Conrad's forces at Dorylaeum, severely weakening the Crusader ranks. Internal conflicts and disputes among the Crusader leadership further undermined their collective efforts. Despite these setbacks, Louis and Conrad eventually managed to assemble their armies near Jerusalem. They made the bold decision to besiege the Syrian stronghold of Damascus, leading a formidable force of around 50,000 crusaders, the largest such army to date. Damascus ruler, however, found himself compelled to call upon Nur al-Din, Zangi's successor, for assistance. The combined Muslim forces inflicted a humiliating defeat upon the Crusaders, effectively concluding the Second Crusade in 1149. Ultimately, the Second Crusade fell short of its lofty ambitions. While it did succeed in reinforcing the Crusader states and cementing ties between Western Europe and the Middle East, it failed to recapture Edessa or substantially alter the regional power dynamics. The Crusaders, once again, found themselves facing the complexities and challenges of the Holy Land as they sought to assert their influence in the region. The roots of the Third Crusade can be traced back to the events of the Second Crusade and the ongoing challenges faced by the Crusader states in the Holy Land. Following the fall of Edessa, two notable Muslim leaders emerged, Saladin and his uncle Shirkuh. In 1169, Shirkuh's forces seized control of Cairo in Egypt. After Shirkuh's passing, Saladin assumed leadership and set about consolidating his power. By 1187, Saladin had launched a significant campaign against the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. His forces achieved a decisive victory at the Battle of Hatton, leading to the capture of Jerusalem and the loss of substantial Crusader-held territory. The catastrophic loss shocked the Christian world, compelling Pope Gregory VIII to issue a call for a new crusade. The objective was clear, to reclaim Jerusalem and safeguard the Christian presence in the Holy Land. This crusade would prove to be even larger than its predecessors, with the support of three of the most prominent leaders in Europe. Leading the English contingent was Richard the Lionheart, renowned for his valor in military prowess, Philip II, the King of France, and Emperor Frederick I, known as Barbarossa, commanded the French and German armies respectively. 
These three monarchs were among the most prominent figures of their era, underscoring the immense significance of the Crusade. In 1189, the Crusaders embarked on their journey to the Holy Lands. Barbarossa's expedition encountered numerous challenges, and tragically, he passed away in Anatolia the following year. His army continued under the command of his successor, Frederick VI of Swabia. The pivotal Battle of the Crusade unfolded in September 1191, when Richard's forces achieved a significant victory over Saladin's troops at the Battle of Versouf. Following this triumph, the Crusaders pressed on, capturing the cities of Jaffa and Acre. Yet despite these victories, the Crusaders fell short of their ultimate goal to retake Jerusalem. Exactly a year after the Battle of Versouf, Richard and Saladin signed a peace treaty that re-established the Kingdom of Jerusalem, though without regaining control of the city itself. This treaty granted Christians access to Jerusalem while it remained under Muslim administration. The Third Crusade, while not achieving its ultimate objective of reclaiming Jerusalem, secured several notable victories and negotiated crucial concessions. It cemented Richard the Lionheart's reputation as a legendary military leader and temporarily stabilized the Christian presence in the Holy Land. The Fourth Crusade, spanning from 1202 to 1204, unfolds as a departure from the typical crusade narrative characterized by intricate geopolitical complexities and unforeseen outcomes. Initially, its objective was to reclaim Jerusalem from Muslim control, but it veered dramatically off course, ultimately resulting in the sack of two Christian cities, including the Eastern Roman capital of Constantinople. At the end of the 12th century, the Eastern Roman Empire found itself in a state of decline, confronting external threats from both Western European powers and Muslim forces. The the papacy in Rome sought to reconcile the long-standing schism between the Western and Eastern Christian churches, which had persisted for centuries. Pope Innocent III perceived an opportunity to bridge the divide and issued a call for a crusade aimed at reclaiming Jerusalem while striving to assert papal authority over the Eastern Orthodox Church. To reach the Holy Lands, the Crusaders from Western Europe required a substantial fleet. They negotiated an agreement with the Venetians, led by Doge Enrico Dandolo, who possessed one of the largest fleets in Europe at the time, to transport the Crusader army to the Holy Lands. However, unlike previous crusades where major European rulers provided substantial support, the Fourth Crusade was marked by disorganization and a lack of centralized leadership. Many crusaders embarked on their journey in an uncoordinated manner. This resulted in far fewer crusaders arriving in Venice than anticipated, making it impossible to pay the Venetians for their services. In response, the Venetians proposed an alternative solution. The Crusaders would assist them in capturing the city of Zara from King Emmerich of Hungary and Croatia. The problem was that Zara was a Catholic city, and King Emmerich was a pious Christian who was well liked by the Pope. Consequently, some Crusaders abandoned the mission, disbanded, or sought their own paths to the Holy Lands. Despite this, the majority of the Crusader army launched an attack on Zara and successfully captured it in late 1202. Pope Innocent, upon learning of this, promptly excommunicated the Crusaders, a fact which was concealed by the Crusader leaders. While stationed in Zara, one of the Crusade's leaders, Boniface of Montferrat, ventured to visit his cousin Philip of Swabia's court. It was there that he encountered the exiled Eastern Roman prince Alexios Angelos, who made an enticing offer to the Crusaders, a substantial sum of money in exchange for installing him as the Eastern Roman Emperor in Constantinople. Excommunicated and still facing financial difficulties, the Crusaders accepted his offer and departed for Constantinople. Upon Alexios' ascent to the Eastern Roman throne, he was unable to fulfill his financial promises to the Crusaders. In response, they laid siege to and ultimately sacked the city in 1204, resulting in widespread destruction and pillaging. This marked a tragic turning point in the history of the Eastern Roman Empire. Following the sack, the Crusaders established the Latin Empire of Constantinople, with Baldwin of Flanders as its inaugural emperor. However, this newly founded state would prove to be short-lived. Just a year after its establishment, the Latin Empire faced defeat at the hands of King Kalayan of Bulgaria, a blow from which it would never recover. The Fourth Crusade stands as an embarrassing chapter in European history, underscoring the profound influence of complex political and economic interests on the course of a religiously motivated expedition. Following the grim conclusion of the Fourth Crusade, Europe witnessed a shift in the scale and focus of the Crusades. Large-scale endeavors to recapture the Holy Land would become increasingly rare. Instead, throughout the remainder of the 13th century, a variety of Crusades emerged, 
with objectives extending beyond merely toppling Muslim forces in the Holy Land. These campaigns were often aimed at combating any and all groups perceived as enemies of the Christian faith. One such crusade was the Albigensian Crusade, which spanned from 1208 to 1229. Its goal was to eradicate the heretical Qatari sect of Christianity in France. In parallel, the Baltic Crusades, occurring from 1211 to 1225, sought to subdue pagans in Northern Europe. In 1212, a movement known as the Children's Crusade unfolded, when thousands of young children vowed to march to Jerusalem. However, many historians do not consider it a true crusade, as there are many uncertainties regarding the authenticity of this event. Regardless, this endeavor never reached the Holy Land. The Fifth Crusade, set in motion by Pope Innocent III before his death in 1216, saw crusaders launching an attack on Egypt from both land and sea. However, they were ultimately compelled to surrender to Muslim defenders led by Saladin's nephew, al malik al-Kamil, in 1221. In 1229, the Sixth Crusade, led by Emperor Frederick II, achieved the peaceful transfer of Jerusalem to crusader control through negotiations with al-Kamil. However, the peace treaty lapsed a decade later, and Muslims easily regained control control of Jerusalem. Between 1248 and 1254, Louis IX of France organized the Seventh Crusade, targeting Egypt. Unfortunately for Louis, his campaign proved unsuccessful. In 1268, Sultan Baibars of the Mamluks laid waste to Antioch. Responding to this destruction, Louis organized another crusade, known as the Eighth Crusade in 1270. While the initial goal was to aid the remaining crusader states in Syria, the mission was redirected to Tunis where Louis met his end. In 1271, Edward I of England embarked on another expedition, often grouped with the Eighth Crusade but sometimes referred to as the Ninth Crusade. This campaign achieved little and it is often regarded as the last significant crusade to the Holy Land. The year 1291 marked a significant turning point as one of the last remaining crusader cities, Acre, fell to the Muslim Mamluks. Many historians regard this event as marking the effective conclusion of the era of the Crusades in European history. Though the church organized minor crusades with limited objectives after 1291, primarily military campaigns aimed at reclaiming conquered territory or conquering pagan regions, support for such efforts waned in the 16th century. This decline corresponded with the rise of the Reformation and the diminishing authority of the papacy. Thank you for watching this video about the Crusades. If you enjoyed the video, Please support our channel by giving us a like and subscribing for more content like this in the future.